required attendees. My mic's on. Okay. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are so excited to spend some time with you today. Um, from the looks of the crowd that's coming in, I think this is a topic that is on the fronts of everyone's minds. You know, how can I one day be a corporate board director? What is governance all about? And I am really honored uh, to moderate this session. My name is Tony Leatherberry. I am a partner with Deloitte. I've been with Deloitte for 29 years. And I am also our board relations practice leader for our risk and advisory practice with the firm. I am honored to be on this stage with two not only esteemed board leaders, but senior executive women in corporate America serving Fortune 500 companies. And so to my immediate right is Peggy Alford, and in a moment she will introduce herself. And then to my far right is Paula Price. So let's welcome them with a warm round of applause. And I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves particularly highlighting key inflection points in their career that has gotten them to the point of being a corporate board director. Can I start? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. So happy to be here with you today. Um, so I actually, um, I have a finance background. I, I am a CPA and started um, in public accounting. I spent um, eight years, eight to nine years at Arthur Anderson, which is not, doesn't exist anymore, post Enron. Um, but in the audit and then the, the M&A practice. Um, and, and then I joined eBay from, um, from Anderson. I was there until the very end at Anderson. Um, I joined eBay in, 20, in, t in 2002 um, in a very similar role that I was playing, sort of doing diligence on deals. Um, at PayPal, the, the PayPal acquisition was my first um, engagement um, at eBay. And then I, um, I moved more into general finance, and I had the opportunity to be the CFO of a company that eBay acquired. Um, so that was sort of a turning point in my career a bit to sort of expand into broader finance. Um, and then I went on um, to join PayPal, um, which, was, which eBay owned at the time, and, um, and then played a lot of different roles, operating roles. I was a general manager for a while. I ran global cross-border trade. And then I actually also, um, I was co-running HR for a while before I actually left in um, August of 2017, and I spent two years at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is Mark Zuckerberg and his wife's foundation um, from the Facebook wealth, and was the CFO and head of operations there, and then rejoined PayPal in, about, in uh, March of last year um, as the um, head of core markets, which was essentially running commercial teams in all of our core markets. And then very recently, um, in the last couple weeks, um, took over global sales at PayPal. And I joined the Mace Rich Board, which is a real estate investment trust, um, in 2018, and then Facebook's board um, in May of 2019. Okay, thank you. And Paula? Hi, uh, good morning, or afternoon. Uh, morning, still morning. <laughs> I don't even know what time it is yeah, anymore. Exactly. That's how I moved on. But I'm really happy to be here also. And um, so my background, too, is quite varied. But I started also at Arthur Anderson um, in the uh, audit practice. And, um, and now I'm on the board of Accenture, uh, which, <laughs> which, has, which, is, which has sort of come out of Arthur Anderson. And so in that sense, I feel like I've come full circle. Um, and from there, I worked at Kraft Foods uh, in Chicago doing uh, financial, mostly financial planning and analysis and strategy work. Uh, from there, I went to Diageo um, in London, so I got some international experience, uh, also uh, financial planning. And then I went back to the States, and I started uh, at Prudential, and I did a general management role uh, there in financial services, retirement services and then to J.P. Morgan Financial Services. <laughs> uh, and, and then from there to CVS, uh, 
uh, which uh, is in uh, Rhode Island. And so there I did a, a controllership role to Ahold, also in New England, and I did a divisional CFO role. Um, and then I pivoted my career into a world I knew nothing about. And so when you talk about milestones, um, I pivoted into the world of academia. Uh, and I taught uh, for four years at Harvard. And so there I picked up really unique skills. So it was a learning opportunity and a teaching opportunity. Uh, but skills that I use uh, in my day job and I use them also uh, on the board. Uh, but over the course of my career in terms of milestones, I would say it was um, really just pivoting into different um, functions. So uh, general management, strategy, financial planning, and accounting. Um, uh, across uh, geographies, so the US and the UK, and across uh, companies and industries, so financial services, retail, and consumer products. Uh, so it's been, uh, and now of course, uh, finally, with uh, Macy's, where I'm the CFO, um, and so it's bringing all of this, <laughs> <laughs> bringing all of those skills uh, together. And over the course of that, I've served on a few boards. My first board was uh, Charming Shops uh, in 2010. Uh, and then I did uh, Western Digital, Dollar General, and Accenture all at the same time. And now I'm currently only on the Accenture board. Mm -hmm. So that's in, in a nutshell. Okay. Well, as you can see, they have had a phenomenal career journey. Um, we were talking earlier about how those experiences lead you to board service because if they were just based on their titles alone of CFO, that's like being a unicorn. And as my daughter would say, a rainbow unicorn, right? They're probably about... Um, two to four, depending on which report you read, black female CFOs right now in Fortune 500 companies. And my phone rings a lot about, open up your Rolodex, tell me who to call, you know, who can I call to recruit to, to a corporate board who is a black female CFO? So the good news is, the phone calls that I'm getting, black females in the corporate board governance roles are a hot commodity right now. But when you go on title alone, it's very difficult to find them. So I would ask both of you, Peggy and Paula, to talk about, are you seeing a shift from title to competency and skills and experience? And how have you used your own rich career path to sell yourself that way and maybe not just on title alone? Sure, I, I would start, and um, I would say definitely seeing a shift in terms of people or boards looking for specific roles, so uh, sitting CFOs, for example, um, to looking for skills, uh, looking for skill sets. And um, uh, depending on where the company is in its journey, um, they may be looking for someone with deep uh, accounting skills, so they may be looking for a controller. Um, or you know, they may be looking for someone with uh, M&A skills. Uh, and so I think there is an opening. But you also see um, looking for skills in digital, in, in technology, and in mobility. And so they're moving away um, uh, gradually, so not, not fully, but moving mm -hmm. away somewhat from the traditional titles, the C-suite titles, and being more open in terms of what skills you bring um, to, to these board positions, and I think that's important. And so in terms of how I've used my own background, I really describe myself in terms of the unique skills and talents that I can bring to a board seat. And I actually try to pivot them away from looking at me as a financial expert, which is sort of an SEC-defined term, to looking at me as someone who can bring to bear the fullness of my uh, career experience from different retail uh, different uh, sectors, so retail, financial services, uh, consumer products, different disciplines, so that um, you can expect me to participate fully in all of the board discussions, both strategically uh, mm -hmm. as well as in my role uh, as usually the audit committee chair or the finance committee chair. Um, you can expect me to participate fully in the full board conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I would agree that, you know, we always have to fill out the audit committee, so you always need um, financial experts, um, and that is, you know, very specifically defined right. by the SEC. Um, so there always are 
um, CFO types or um, finance types that are needed. Often though, those seats can be filled by people who are not financial experts in the sense of having been, been a CFO. So a lot of um, high growth um, or early public companies, um, they have investors that, you know, in their earlier stage sit on the board and that fills that criteria. And what I'm seeing, um, in, especially in the technology space, is that, you know, if you think about some of the other committees that they need to fill out, um, there's a real need, you know, the human capital or people, the people side of, um, of a company is, you know, increasingly being known as the most, one of the most important things you need to think about. And as companies go through multiple stages of growth, um, the ability to attract and retain talent um, is something that you know someone with an HR background would be mm -hmm. um, very qualified to be a part of. A lot of the technology companies and even companies outside of the technology space are dealing with specific things around data and privacy and things like that. So suddenly, you know, if you look at compliance, um, you know, people that have skill sets in compliance or in regulatory matters or in um, in data analytics, um, those are areas that could be very attractive to certain companies. Um, all this to say, there is a need for a broad range of skills. And as you mentioned, because of the fact that there are very few um, female or any, you know, um, people of color mm -hmm. um, in, the, um, in the financial um, CFO seat, um, and companies are looking to diversify, they are realizing that they have to go beyond what they may be defined as qualified in the past into something that fits the need of the current stage that these companies are going, th going through, as well as the pool of talent that they need to fill the boards. So Peggy, I'm gonna start with, as you went through your vast career experience, did you have any other board experience, particularly not-for-profit, before you landed your first corporate board experience? Because when I look around this room, there are all kinds of ages in here, and not right. everybody's gonna start with right. a Fortune exactly. 500 board, right? Yeah, so, yeah I had mm -hmm. very little. However, I had been on a not-for-profit board. Um, I will say that I think, you know, landing your first board seat, in my experience, um, not just with myself, but also people that I know, is often relational in some way. Mm -hmm. It's either someone that you worked with or someone that, you know, um, that was a, a, a colleague of a colleague type of, um, type of situation. Um, I don't see as many of the board seats being filled by these, um, you know, I'm sure all of you have gotten the LinkedIn reach outs where it's a company that's looking to place mm -hmm. board members. Um, I think that can work sometimes, but it's not really usually, at least in my experience, where the boards are being filled. Right. But I do think that in terms of getting board experience, um, you know, the dynamic of how a boardroom works or how you work with leadership, what your role is as a board member versus being operational within a company, um, being on a not-for-profit board can give you all those same experiences that you would have um, in a Fortune 500 um, you know, boardroom. And I think it's really important in terms mm -hmm. of just understanding how different that dynamic is mm -hmm. being a board member versus being an, a, 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 an employee mm -hmm. at a company. And Paula, did you have yeah, any not-for-profit experience? Yeah, so I've, I've always served on non-profit, uh, non-for-profit boards, mm -hmm. um, uh, always. And I found that that was super helpful, not only in terms of helping me engage with the cause, but uh, as Peggy mentioned, just sort of getting a sense for the dynamics. Um, very often, the non-profit boards uh, function pretty much pretty they similar mm -hmm. uh, to uh, corporate boards. Uh, they have the same committees. Um, and it, it really just, as a new board member, it's, it's super valuable just getting a sense for, you know, board behavior, um, how to phrase questions and um, the, the delineation between boards and management. Um, you can get all of that information and so, as, and you take that with you to the corporate um, roles. It helps you during the interviewing process. Um, it helps you once you're in those chairs. Um, so it's really valuable experience for, for many reasons. Um, but also to build on, on Peggy's point, the relationships are very key. That's right. Um, especially, especially the second and third, and maybe I guess the first one as well. Um, so I said at one point that I was on three boards uh, at a time, but for all three of those boards, I could point to, you know, I was in somebody's seat that I knew. Mm -hmm. So uh, usually somebody that I worked with or somebody uh, that I served on a board with. Um, 
and that's another thing uh, that nonprofit boards are helpful uh, with because you never know who's watching in these board seats. That's so right. You're serving on a board and people are watching you because often board positions beget board positions and those directors can't take all of the roles. So they're watching you so that they can refer you to mm -hmm. others. And so uh, being in a nonprofit setting, you can get uh, referrals onto corporate boards by people watching your behavior in the boardroom there. Same is true when you're in a corporate yeah. boardroom. And what I would say to many of you, um, you know, think about your university, your alma mater. Um, how could you serve on a business school advisory board or the engineering school advisory board, um, moving up to the board of trustees of those, those universities? Um, think about United Way, your local chapters. Um, those are great experiences to understand what governance is about. So saying that, I'm going to pivot a little bit to talk about, from your perspectives, what is the difference in the role of a board member or the governance um, and oversight responsibilities versus management's responsibilities. Yeah, I mean, I think if you are in management at a company, you are responsible for operationalizing the strategy. So you're going to be responsible for helping contribute to what the growth strategy should be um, and the operating rhythms of a particular company and then executing on that strategy to operationalize it in some of the you know, the nuances that come with actually implementing a strategy become very, mm -hmm. um, very, you know, important. Um, as a board member, you are responsible for um, helping advise leadership and management as to strategic direction. You are responsible for oversight. You're responsible for governance. Um, and those are roles that are much more advisory in nature. And, um, and you may get involved, depending on what the company's going through, and helping with ensuring that you have the right assets in place to be able to operationalize, but you are not responsible for the day-to-day -day, um, decision-making of oper operationalizing a strategy. So there's a fine line between uh, being a board member and being management, and you don't want to go beyond that line, but you also do want to carry out your responsibilities. Another key responsibility of the board is to hire and, uh, and care for and uh, potentially fire the CEO uh, because you're really counting on that person to execute the strategy. And so that's, a, that's sort of a real direct, direct role. Um, another uh, responsibility of the board is, uh, is that, uh, so if you're the audit uh, committee chair, for example, is in risk management. So if there's a problem uh, at a company uh, a fraud or irregularity in financial statements, the call goes to the audit committee chair. Uh, and it's the audit committee chair that's on the hook for making sure that the company mm -hmm. works through that particular problem. That's right. So you, in order to carry out that level of responsibility, you do have to have some deep knowledge of the company. It can't just be um, sort of uh, surface knowledge. You do have to, it may feel like you're crossing the line, but you really have to go deep enough in order to carry out your mm -hmm. responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when Paula talks about risk, there's financial risk, which you were talking a lot about, but there's also business risk, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, there are all types of risks that a company may face that you know may not manifest themselves directly into the financial statements in the short term, but are major risks in terms of the continuity or the ability for that company to grow. And those are the responsibility of the board as well. Peggy, you just touched on something that I think is really a, a boardroom dilemma right now, and that is brand and reputational ri risk, particularly in the you know the time of the Me Too movement. Um, everyone with a, a cell phone is now a news anchor. Right. Um, <laughs> and, no, it's true, and and so when you think about um, brand and reputation. Um, as one business risk, how is that presenting itself in the boardroom today? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you very specific. I'm on the board of Facebook. Um, you know, that's a that's a board that you know there are there are major business risks um, that are reputational in nature, mm -hmm. um, that are regulatory in nature, and um, the you know the but the the financial statements are doing quite well. The stock price is doing quite well. And so a lot of what we focus on is really working through these very nuanced issues um, that, you know, to the um, news anchor with a cell phone, as you, as you mm -hmm. allude to, um, seem very black and white. 
Right, and, and a lot of people have really strong opinions about you know, what hate speech is and what free speech is and how we should be um, you know, operationalizing those in terms of how we interact with each other and how social media works. But when you get into the details, you realize that they're very difficult to work through. These are mm -hmm. um, very complex issues. And so mm -hmm. those are things that are examples of things that we as board members are working through with leadership mm -hmm. that um, maybe weren't even topics um, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, five years ago. And, and Paul, are you seeing a structural change to committee structure or the boardroom as a result of the complexities of risk today? I would say that there's some issues that would traditionally go into the audit committee, but they're so uh, wide and so broad and so important that uh, we push them out into mm -hmm. the full board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, an ex uh, two examples, one would be the coronavirus at the moment, which is a full board uh, issue, but another example would be the Me Too movement that, mm -hmm. um, that you mentioned before. Um, and, and the way we get at that is through the data. So that would have normally have been part of the compliance reporting that goes into the board. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and we would expect to see that data increase as a result of the movement, uh, and we did. Uh, and so when you see this spike, uh, and it's such a sensitive issue, and everybody's asking about it, you move it into the full board, mm -hmm. uh, and you know you expect to see spikes, but this is such an important issue that mm -hmm. you really have to get behind the data and see exactly mm -hmm. why these things are spiking, and you know, are these cases that stick or don't stick? Um, but uh, there's some issues that traditionally go into the committees, and others that are so big and so important that you want the full board to have visibility to them. Right. Yeah, and skill sets, specific skill right. sets that I would point to in terms of um, that have cropped up in terms of being attractive to boards as a result of some of the things you mentioned. So um, attorneys, it used mm -hmm. to be that attorneys um, weren't on a lot of boards. That's and right. And now there's a real need to ensure, and this is everything from litigation to compliance, regulatory to um, you know employee, law. Um, these are all areas that are becoming extremely important to have expertise on the board for. Um, chief privacy officers or their um, teams are skill sets right. that are starting to become very attractive. Um, those that are very um, knowledgeable about compliance and regulatory matters. These are things that weren't necessarily top of mind in terms of getting talent on boards right. and now um, these folks are extremely attractive to companies. So, so what I hear you saying is as business is becoming more and more complex, as um, companies are becoming more and more global, because that drives yeah. a lot of the compliance Absolutely. and regulatory issues as well, our boardrooms have to be more agile and more diverse in terms of capability to face off against that. Exactly right. um, I'm, I'm not gonna deep dive into this, because again, many of you may not be exposed to how um, a board is run, but there are typically three standing committees that you can look up and understand about more. Um, Peggy and Paul have talked about the audit committee a lot in this conversation. So this is the audit committee. The nomination governance committee is the, is the committee that really focuses on boardroom governance. The nomination process typically may even drive the CEO selection process. And then lastly, um, Compen thank you, comp composition, um, uh, compensation I should say where they're focused on paying the CEO and making sure that the talent throughout the organization, there's equity, equitable pay. Mm -hmm. So look those up. We're not gonna go into a lot of, of, of detail around that, but just wanted to give you the context because we were throwing around terms. The thing that I would like to do now is pivot to how do you get ready for that first board opportunity? And this could be at the not-for-profit level as well as ultimately at a Fortune 500 company level. You know, let's talk about how you prepare a board bio that's different than a resume for a job. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how you have a courtship because I think it's a bi-directional courtship. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about how you vet and go through the vetting process. Mm -hmm. Um, so the preparation, uh, uh, really, the board bio is different from um, a, a typical resume insofar as what you're doing is really highlighting the skills that are important to a board. So if you reflect over your whole career and you think about 
um, companies and you think about what's, what's important now, so um, certainly uh, as a financial person, that's important, but also if there's anything that is related to data analytics, anything that's related to security, anything that's related to privacy, anything that you've done that you know is relevant and useful to a board and to a company and to shareholders, that goes onto your, onto your board bio. Um, any, anything that um, uh, relates to um, the typical, the education, the, education, the um, uh, things, even your companies, um, that's all bunched into maybe two paragraphs. But it's really skills driven. It's here's when you think about your board and you think about the sort of skills that you need on your board, you're giving them the vocabulary to talk to their fellow directors about you um, that would be relevant for that board. Board seats are very competitive, and so you need in one page a couple paragraphs to be able to explain why you would be attractive to a board, what skills you would bring to a board. Um, I always put a photo on there because I don't want there to be any confusion. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so, so I like right. to be very clear on you know who I am and 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 you know what it is uh, I bring diversity. If if um, if, uh, if that's something that you're looking for, and all boards should be looking for that, um, I put that on the my photo so it's clear um, that that's a perspective that I'll be bringing. I'll put a little bit about my family on there because boards are looking for. Uh, what unique skill sets you bring, but also are you going to be a good fit? Is there going to be chemistry? Um, so anything that helps them picture you on their board goes onto your bio. Um, and so I'll stop there. I know you had a multi-part uh, question, but okay, I'll stop sure. there. Yeah, and I, I'll just build on that and add a few things that I think are helpful. I definitely think that one of the things that all boards are looking for is um, a very collaborative um, board member, someone who can take a wide variety of perspectives and experience and create a, a, a productive dialogue that sort of enables you to get to a place where you can really provide really good um, insight and oversight to leadership. And so anything that you can, um, you know, that you can highlight around um, sort of cross-functional work that you've done, um, positions you've had that enabled you to influence without owning, right? Because that's something that I think most companies require. Um, so if you can highlight that, that's helpful because um, when we talk about fit, a lot of times the fit is somebody who's going to be able to pivot from a role where they owned something within a company end to end, to the extent that that happens in a company, mm -hmm. not always, um, to someone who can actually provide a productive um, way of bringing together all of these board members to something that's going to be productive. So I think that that's helpful. Um, I also think that, you know, you have your board bio, but as I mentioned, I really think that board seats are often filled through relationships. So it's really important for you to talk with people about your interest in being on a board and talking to a wide variety of people about what you think you would bring to a board, what types of board you think you would be additive to. Um, because you never know who's going to get a call and need to pull out their list of people that they can refer. Um, because as Paula mentioned, um, and, and for me, my company only allows us to be on two public boards. And it's sort of one of those circular things that once you're on a board, people are interested on, in you being on other ones because you're kind of a known entity then. Um, but I'm able then to refer lots of talented people with an eye on diversity and really creating board rooms that mm -hmm. look way more like our general population as opposed to what they looked like in the past. And so I'm always looking for people to add to my list um, that I can recommend when I get calls. And I would just add to that, um, talking to as many people as you can about your desire, your interest, and your uh, skill sets for a board is important but I would also make a point to talk to people who are on boards mm -hmm. um, for the reasons that Peggy outlined is because they're getting calls and so they need to be able to refer. So talk to as many people who serve on boards and then the second um, uh, source would be as recruiters call you and for job opportunities, for example, you can talk to them and tell them of your interest in boards so that they can then refer you to the board practice um, of their particular company. Yeah. So it's really making sure that it's not a secret that you want to join boards 
A, and then B, this is your skill set that you bring to a yeah. board so that you're giving, again, people the vocabulary to talk about you when they talk to the uh, companies or the recruiters that are looking for board, uh, board directors. So um, I think that if we look at the S&P 500, the average age of a board director is about 72. I am not 72, Who knew? by the way. <laughs> I'm throwing it out there, I'm just saying. <laughs> Having said that, what are you seeing in terms of a shift to younger directors? Yeah. Younger, because it relates to yes. the conversation before. You're looking for different kinds of skills. You're looking for technology yeah. skills. You're looking for data analytic skills. You're looking for security skills, digital skills. These are relatively new skills. And so as a result of that, you're seeing the average age inch down. It's not, it's not coming down, obviously, fast right. enough. <laughs> it's still 72. But as they replenish yeah. board seats, it's often with people that are That's younger, right. mm -hmm. earlier in their career. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, a lot, of, a lot of companies, especially in the technology space where I play, um, have uh, age caps. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's everywhere, but mm -hmm. in, in the technology. Age limits as well as term limits. limits. Like meaning mm -hmm. that you know, once you're, I think yep. it, you know, a lot of companies, it's, it's between 75 and 77. So if you start when you're 72, you're not gonna get very many years out of someone. And so that's mm -hmm. another reason why they yes. would be looking yeah. for younger. So with that, um, I think we're gonna go to Q&A. Um, Great, I'm seeing a lineup already. All right, why don't we start? Hello, my name is Damier Zandrine, and I'm a lawyer, actually, for a payments technology company, somewhat smaller than PayPal. Nice. It was great to hear you say that you are seeing um, you know, a desire for attorneys, because I always thought that that's really not what is desired. But I wanted to ask you, and thank you for the specific actionable advice. It's been great. What Now that you're on the board, are you seeing that there's any implicit bias, or is your voice not being heard just because you are a woman on what I presume are very male-heavy boards? Um, so one of the things that I really focused on when I was vetting from the perspective of do I want to join these boards is that I actually was going to have a voice and they weren't looking to just fill some sort of um, quota that, you know, or uh, diversify the board for purposes of being able to, um, you know, show that they have, they have a diverse board. I wanted to make sure that I felt like I was going to have a voice and something to contribute. So that's something that I would say is going to be dependent on the board that you're on and something that you should absolutely explore. Um, one of the questions that I ask is what, what are the characteristics you're looking for in a new board member? I think that gives you an opportunity to, if their first thing that they mention is we're trying to diversify, I would put your antenna up. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually um, ask specific questions because I do want um, them to feel like that I'm contributing something other than how I'm gonna look on their website. Okay, great. I, I do think, and just yeah. to build on that question, I do think that um, um, you know the interviews for board seats, it's two-way. So That's you're right. interviewing them and they're inter interviewing you. But I also think that um, you will encounter this, um, this sort of unconscious bias no matter where, and you will encounter it in the boardroom. So you need to prepare yourself to make sure that you can do your job and you can make your voice heard. I, I don't think that that's, um, I don't think you can figure that out through the interviewing process. You will figure it out as you're sitting in the boardroom and the onus is really on you to punch through that. Yeah, Paula and Peggy, I think a component of that too is the courtship process. So on average, how long did it take either one of you to go through that courtship process because a boardroom culture is also unique and you've got to understand whether or not you're comfortable with its culture. And how did you test for that? Yeah, I, I think it's as Peggy said, it's asking sort of the right questions, but the difference between the courtship process for a board and for um, a, a corporate job is that it's much longer, Yes. right? And so uh, you have time to uh, do a lot of research 
on every person that you're going to speak with. You have time to come up on their background, where they've been. Um, I always say you should never meet a stranger in this day and age because you just put their name in and blah. Mm -hmm. And so you can mm -hmm. form your questions around that to try to get a sense for each individual. Right. And the way it works is you'll talk to a lot of people. So you may talk to on the nominating governance committee, the chair, or you may talk to the full committee, or some companies have you talk to the full board. So you really get a sense for like who these people are. And I prefer to talk to the more the better because that gives me a sense mm -hmm. of the culture and, and then beyond that, I prefer to talk to just one or two people in management because that gives me a sense of the culture of the company as well. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as we've said before, it's a two-way two -way street, especially after you get beyond that That's first right. board. Um, so you really try to get a sense through this long courtship process that you have. It could take six months, it could take a year before these seats are filled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mentioned the question that I asked, but I think, um, you know, one of the ways you can ask some of your questions is by sort of saying, you know, I, I have to, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to have the time or if I'm the right skill set for this job. Um, I'm trying to understand a little bit more about it so that if it's not me, I can recommend pro, um, in, right. in the right way. And so that's what enables you to ask, like, so, you know, when you called me, what was it that you were you know, interested in um, what are those what are those characteristics? Who's on the board currently? What are you trying to fill in this next seat? Um, how does the board dynamic work? A lot of times, you might have an opportunity to sit in a board meeting before right. you ultimately decide. That can tell you a lot in terms of just how that dynamic actually works, um, because there absolutely are boards where you you know you aren't really serving a function that you're, you're basically just um, you know, check the box, we have a board. Mm -hmm. And then there are others where they truly are using them to advise, to help them make sure that they can work through particular issues. Um, and so it's important to really understand how that dynamic works by talking to both people in management, as Paula mentioned, as well as the folks on the board. Good morning, my name is Genevieve Gonigan. I'm the Director of Employee Relations for the Flying Food Group. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the time and financial commitment of being on a board and then how you're juggling that with your day-to-day -day job and your home life. Mm -hmm. So the uh, time commitment depends. Um, it can be uh, quite significant. So I, I'll do two things. One is a nonprofit board and one is a corporate board. Um, the time commitment for a nonprofit board can be as much as you'd like. Um, very often, they'll uh, take all the time that you're willing to give. Uh, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, that, that can be quite significant in terms of the amount of time commitment. And for some of the boards, there is a financial commitment, the nonprofit board, from you to them. Um, and so that varies by board, uh, and it's usually to support the organization uh, on whose board you sit. Uh, in a corporate board, the time commitment, uh, it's, it's usually sort of fixed, um, and it's a quarterly cadence to it, and you can get your arms around it. It can be significant, so audit tends to be uh, sort of the workhorse of a board, so there's a, a fairly significant time commitment there, and if there's anything that goes wrong or that's um, or if you need to fill um, uh, the CEO seat, then the time commitment gets to be even more so. And the financial commitment comes the other way. So you get paid for serving on a corporate board. Um, and so the balance part is, you know, how do you balance all the things that we balance in our lives? There's no sort of um, a silver bullet to that, you just do, right? And, and so th this is just one more thing that um, you want to do, and so therefore you, you figure out how to make it all work. And I would add that's when things are just going steady state. Um, when there's a merger and acquisition transaction, when there are other uh, events, um, then the demand can go up in terms of what the board needs to convene on. And if it's a global company, you're, you have to, you know, you're taking calls in the middle of the night sometimes. It, it's, you know, it just varies. Yeah. Okay. But for any public company, you can actually look up in their 10K and their proxy mm -hmm. um, what board members make. And mm -hmm. it's going to vary. Companies, um, you know, because it's public, companies are usually, um, they, they look closely at what they pay board members. But that's something that you can look up um, if you were interested. 
Hi, I am Tiffany Hunter. I'm from Dallas, Texas. And a couple of things. First, I was at an event. I have a very strong marketing communications background. And, um, and one of the speakers was saying that to be on a corporate board, with, even though I have a strong marketing background, that you still have to have, regardless of what, you do have a strong financial background, like the ability to read and understand you know, financial statements. So I wanted to get your input on that, number one. Number two, um, how do you, as a corporate board member, um, protect yourself in the event that something happens uh, with the company? You know, That's how are you question. protected? And lastly, like if I wanted to be on the board, if I didn't have the relationships, like is there a site? Like do you, like a LinkedIn for corporate boards? <laughs> yeah, so on the first one, I mean, I don't think, every, you will never find on a board that every person on there is um, a financial expert. Um, I think that what is important is being able to understand the growth drivers of a company. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to be able to um, walk through each line of the P&L and explain, um, you know, how it all works, but you, you, you likely should understand um, how the growth drivers of a company work so that you're familiar with how particular decisions would impact um, how you would operate the company. Um, I don't know if you'd add to that. Yeah, you, you need one. For, so for publicly yeah. traded companies, somebody on the board has to be um, a financial expert. And it's helpful if more than one person is literate in financial statements. But everybody doesn't have to be. So it's not everybody doesn't have to be um, a financial expert. Right. Yeah. But what I would say, I'm going to pivot to maybe the second half of your question, which is you know, to make yourself more viable um, as a potential director. There are opportunities now. So there is not, nothing stopping you from learning how to read financial statements now. You know, there are online courses, there are all kinds of books out there that you could just self teach, your, um, you know, teach yourself and have at least a working knowledge of it. Because I do believe every director has a good working knowledge typically of, of a major corporation. Yeah. Um, secondly, you were talking about, you know, uh, LinkedIn. Um, communities, but there are organizations such, such as the National Association of Corporate Directors that you could join. There are also in your local markets educational programs. I live in the Philadelphia area. Drex Drexel has a governance uh, education program as an example, and then there are also local NACD chapters that do education as well. So getting plugged into those now is another channel for letting people know you're interested, you're getting trained, you you know go up the ranks through maybe a not-for-profit and ultimately a corporate board. And I think starting that process when you're earlier in your career rather than later is important because if you think about you know maybe you know depending on how young you all look very young, um, <laughs> depending yes. on how how young <laughs> you things. are, if you think about you know going forward and and being able to create flexibility to where maybe at a certain point in your career you are on three or four boards and then maybe you consult or maybe that's all you do, you have to do, you have to start, you can't start that at the end of your career, right? Um, and so I think starting the process of being prepared to be on a board, being on a not-for-profit board mm -hmm. to sort of start that process earlier in your career rather than later is a good thing. Okay, and I would great. just echo what Tony said, you, you know, in business, a working knowledge of financial statements, whether you're on a board or not, it's just such a good thing to, to have, a great skill. Um, it doesn't have to be super technical or super deep. Just a working knowledge of financial statements is great. And to your third question around how do we protect ourselves, there is mm -hmm. a director and officer insurance that helps uh, in terms of um, if we get into a situation where there's uh, a legal liability, uh, that is helpful. But really, you know, the best thing we can do is to make sure we are uh, performing our fiduciary duty and that we're working with directors who feel the same. Mm -hmm. We're going to take two more, and then you. Okay. Thank you. I'm Jerry Harris, an executive here at MGM Resorts, and I want to welcome you all to Las Vegas, and I'm <laughs> loving the conference. Thank you. Thank you. So I have the unique pleasure of being, my whole career has been in construction and contract space. Um, so as a woman, that is, again, a unique space, typically male-dominated. Male so now I have the unique opportunity, because of a chair position, with an association here of all of the prime contractors, which are majority white contractors, to now sit on the board for this association. So it excited me at first, but it also makes me nervous because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, 
But my whole career has been in that same makeup. But my question is, is there any, um, are there any resources that you would recommend? Because I know that I'm stepping into a unique situation focused on diversity and inclusion. And there will be, I will be the first African American woman to grace those boardroom walls. So thank you. I'm excited, but I'm also nervous. But I know that that's a good thing because I'm getting out of my comfort zone to grow. And I do desire to someday sit on other boards. So just looking for advice on um, resources or things to think about or to be mindful of. Are you talking about resources to get familiar with board service or um, what type of resources are you? Resources for board service, but also to just uh, examples or maybe some um, readings that have that share the experiences of people who have been in sim similar situations. And I do plan to speak to Secretary Herman about this too. <laughs> I mean, one thing that I would say has, you know, gi gives me a lot more confidence when I'm starting, you know, in a board position where, you know, I'm not there every day, so I might not be, um, you know, intimately familiar with the business, is getting information from the company so that I can become quickly versed on exactly how the company operates and the biggest issues that they're facing. Um, there's lots of internal information at any company around that, and I find that that just getting knowledgeable about what they're doing makes me more comfortable that I can start thinking about, okay, what are the parts of my experience that are additive um, to what they're trying to do, mm -hmm. and then that I feel just I just feel more comfortable right. um, being in the boardroom. So that's something that I would I would suggest. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would add to that, I mean, there are resources, uh, the NACD resource that Tony referenced, and other things that you can research. But um, I would actually take a couple, one, two, or three. Uh, board meetings and observe the board dynamics around you. Every board has different, its own dynamics, yeah. mm. and you'll get a sense for like who the most influential board directors are, uh, and why are they the most influential, and why do people listen when they speak, um, and who you need to influence if you want to champion right. diversity and inclusion within this group. So I would read the room, figure out how things get done, uh, and then pick your spot and pick your moment to get in there. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think you can feel very comfortable just, you know, maybe taking the first meeting and not saying a lot. I don't think they're mm -hmm. going to expect you to be jumping in and contributing, and it's al almost better sit mm -hmm. back the first meeting and observe and mm -hmm. learn, and then you're going to quickly figure out mm -hmm. where they need you and um, where you can start being additive, and then and that's just going to grow over time as you become more knowledgeable. I would say lean in. <laughs> Um, a lot of times we'll retreat. You're feeling uncomfortable because you are the person that's a, uh, unique in that room. Pick the two or three directors that, for whatever sets of reasons you might have an initial chemistry with, and lean in and build the rapport with them. L learn from them, get the insight from them, so that you're becoming a part of that community. Mm -hmm. We're going to take the final question and wrap up. Thank you up. so much. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I'm Regina Cross, I'm a vice president, vice president with Goldman Sachs, and wanted to talk a little bit about privately held boards. Um, I've had the opportunity to sit on nonprofit boards. I'm kind of moving into the direction and thinking about corporate boards, but I've actually had privately held companies reach out. And so I'm interested in your thoughts just in thinking about skill sets, evaluation of risk. Obviously, some may be moving towards IPO or some type of transaction, but just in thinking about the skill sets that are necessary and opportunity set within mm -hmm. privately held companies and moving towards corporately held board. And positions. are these typically Goldman Sachs investments, like where they have employees that are sitting? No, they actually conflict us from doing that a okay. lot of times um, from that perspective. So these are typically privately held companies um, that have found me through recommendations okay. or some sense. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, very delicate get within Goldman in terms of where I can sit and where I can't from a risk perspective. But just in thinking about one, companies that may never go public, but yeah. yet have good opportunities from a leadership perspective there, but being conscious and, and evaluating the risk inherent, obviously, with, with those companies as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great experience. Um, I actually sat on a privately, um, a, a pre-IPO um, technology company um, 
before I went back to PayPal. I was conflicted out when I went back to PayPal. But, um, you know, I actually think it's the, it's the exact same experience as you would have on a publicly traded in a little more of an informal setting because they don't have as many um, things that they have to sort of check the box from an SEC perspective. But most of them, especially if they're looking to go public, are following very similar protocol as a publicly um, traded company. And so it's a great opportunity to get experience. And in fact, a lot of those companies are often moving from boards that were primarily made up of investors um, mm -hmm. to those that need to sort of like expand into those that are gonna help them in the next stage of growth. And so it can be a tremendous opportunity to get experience and also um, get other board opportunities from the other board members that are sitting sitting around the table. And the risk, it's okay to ask for their DNO insurance policy to see to what extent you are protected. Um, uh, but the best risk, and the, the same risk will apply really to uh, corporate boards, publicly traded boards as well. Um, the best risk mitigant is really to use great judgment and to evaluate the people who are serving around the table with you and make sure that they're doing yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, with that, we're gonna wrap up. Thank you, ladies. This Thank has you. been phenomenal. Uh, from, from each of you, is there any final pearl of wisdom or pearls of wisdom that you would like to share with this group? I would just reiterate, uh, if you are interested in a board, the first is really um, to make sure that uh, you can articulate and can help others articulate what it is you would bring to the board. So what unique talents, what unique skills you bring to the board. And the second is to begin networking. Don't have it be a secret that you're interested in boards and network with people who can help you get a board seat, people who are on boards or recruiters um, who have board practice. So uh, networking and making sure that you're clear about what you bring to the table. And just know that there are so many companies out there, so don't get discouraged. Start now and don't get discouraged because um, you know, every company of any size has a board of some sort, and so there's a place for you. It's just finding that fit. Well, thank you. Thank you for spending this hour with us. We're going to turn it over to the next panel, and we look forward to seeing you next year. <laughs>